For this month's Critical Care Ultrasound Case of the Month, we're going to discuss a case my colleague had. She was a 30-ish-year-old female who presented to the emergency department with one week of fever, night sweats, cough, and shortness of breath. She had some right-sided chest discomfort. She had a history of COVID six months ago, otherwise no significant past medical history. Her initial vital signs were as follows. Her temperature was 101.5 degrees Fahrenheit, pulse of 133, respirations of 24, a blood pressure of 128 over 85, and an oxygen saturation of 91% on room air. We're already thinking about pneumonia and sepsis, right? Pretty straightforward case. Pertinent physical exam findings include she was unwell appearing but no acute distress, she had clear lungs bilaterally, and she had no lower extremity edema. And a chest x-ray order from triage actually showed pneumonia, so this was just pneumonia, right? I should note that the EKG was somewhat abnormal. It had right axis deviation, tall P waves, and right ventricular hypertrophy. How many people would perform ultrasound at this point? Well, she did, and let's go through the images here. Starting with the parasternal long axis view, we'll go through this systematically. Here's the descending thoracic aorta. Notice that there's no pericardial effusion. We'll also note that the left ventricle, although it is slightly cut off, has a normal ejection fraction or even hyperdynamic based on the fractional shortening here or the E-point septal separation, which is the concept of how close the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve gets to the septum. One other important point is that we have something called the rule of thirds, where the left atrium here, the aortic outflow, and the right ventricle should all approximately be a third. We don't typically measure it, but we eyeball it. And here, the right ventricle appears large, and we'll look at it, this in the parasternal short axis view next. In the parasternal short axis view, we should have a circular left ventricle here and a small crescent-shaped right ventricle here. Notice that it is quite large and actually flattens this interventricular septum at some point in the cardiac cycle. Here is a schematic of a normal RV to LV relationship. Notice that there should not be flattening of this interventricular septum. I have paused the image in diastole, which shows a fairly circular left ventricular cavity. But notice, when you go into systole, what happens to the interventricular septum? Now the interventricular septum is actually flattened, and you create what we call the D sign, which you can see here as a squished left ventricle that looks like the letter D here. Moving on to the apical four-chamber view, there's two important findings that we'll see here. First, you'll notice that the apex is hypercontractile, which often referred to as an apical wink, or sometimes as the trampoline sign, where the apex is bouncing excessively. This, in combination with decreased right-sided function, is the combination we call McConnell sign, which indicates acute elevation of the pulmonary vascular resistance. It was commonly thought to be due to PEs only. However, we now realize it is due to many different findings. The other finding that you'll notice is there's, there's right ventricular dilation. Normally, the right ventricle is smaller than the left ventricle as seen in the schematic here, but in this view, it is actually larger than the left ventricle as measured at the annulus. We have moved on to M mode where we have placed it through the tricuspid annulus, and you'll know this undulating pattern of the tricuspid annulus. If you measure from the height of the tricuspid annulus to the trough, it has only moved 1.4 centimeters. And that is an abnormal tapsy, which indicates poor RV function and is the second half of McConnell sign. In the subxiphoid view, we notice that there's no pericardial effusion, but there's one abnormal finding, which is the thickness of the right ventricular free wall. I will pause the clip here in diastole. We have now paused the subxiphoid view in diastole, and we're looking at the RV free wall thickness. If we measure it against the calipers here, we'll notice that it is approximately 10 millimeters. Anything over 5 millimeters or more is actually abnormal. This indicates right ventricular hypertrophy, which is not normal. Our last view will be the IVC, which shows a plethoric IVC and minimal respiratory variation. So to summarize, we have a hyperdynamic left ventricular ejection fraction, a large right ventricle with decreased function, a D sign, and a McConnell sign. This is concerning for pulmonary hypertension. So this is the important part of the case. If you're concerned for pulmonary hypertension, what other advanced maneuvers can you do to measure pulmonary artery pressures? Although there are 10 or so ways to evaluate pulmonary artery pressures on echocardiograms, I'm going to discuss the two most common methods. The first one is going to determine the tricuspid regurgitant pressure gradient via peak tricuspid regurgitation velocity. 
This is a long way of saying, I'm going to look for the tricuspid regurgitant velocity to measure the pressure gradient between the RV and the pulmonary artery using the Bernoulli equation. We're going to look for a pressure greater than 31 millimeters of mercury. And oftentimes people talk about RVSP, but recent guidelines recommend not using the IVC measurement to add on right atrial pressure. Second, we're going to talk about the mean pulmonary artery pressure via flow through the right ventricular outflow tract. So we can actually calculate the mean pulmonary artery pressure by looking at the RVOT acceleration time, and we're going to look for a number greater than 20 millimeters of mercury. So let's go through each one of these. We're going to start by obtaining a view of the tricuspid regurgitation from one of three views. The RV inflow view, which was mentioned in our last lecture, the apical four-chamber view, or a parasternal short axis view at the basal part of the heart. We're going to place continuous wave Doppler through the tricuspid regurgitant jet, and we're going to measure the peak tricuspid regurgitant velocity, which is seen here. If you notice that they have it graphed here at 4.9 meters per second. Then we're going to apply the Bernoulli equation, which we mentioned earlier. It was 4 times that velocity squared, and it calculates the pressure gradient of 97 millimeters mercury. Thankfully, the ultrasound machine does this for you, seen here. One important point is that echo does not give you absolute pressure, only pressure gradients. And so we can calculate the pressure gradient between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery as 97 millimeters of mercury. One important point is that the peak tricuspid regurgitant velocity of 2.8 or the pressure gradient of 31 millimeters of mercury suggests pulmonary hypertension, but you cannot exclude pulmonary hypertension due to the lack of a TR jet. If you cannot get a TR jet, we're going to talk about what to do next. So using the right ventricular outflow tract, we can actually measure the pulmonary artery pressures without a TR jet. We're going to get a parasternal short axis view at the base of the heart as seen here. We're going to activate pulse wave Doppler and put it just proximal to the pulmonic valve, and you'll get the tracing seen here for our patient. We're going to focus on how quickly blood flow reaches peak velocity here. You'll notice here that the blood flow achieves peak velocity rather quickly, and this can be measured by a finding called the RVOT acceleration time, also known as the pulmonary artery acceleration time, as measured here in red. It's the time it takes to reach peak velocity. It's reported here as 88 milliseconds. You'll actually notice that the shorter the RVOT acceleration time, the higher the pulmonary artery pressure. If you had a very compliant lung, you actually would have a longer time to reach peak uh, velocity. This can be graphed or calculated via this equation here. With uh, our patient's RVOT acceleration time of 88 plugged in, you get a mean pulmonary artery pressure of 35 which again is higher than the 20 that you're looking for. One other finding that you'll note is there is something called the mid-systolic notch, which is another finding that suggests increased pulmonary artery pressures. In this measurement, you do not need a tricuspid regurgitant jet. A commonly discussed sign is called the 60-60 sign, which looks for acute elevations in pulmonary pressures, and it's the combination of the two findings that we just discussed. So you're looking for a tricuspid regurgitant pressure gradient of less than 60 and a pulmonary artery acceleration time of less than 60 milliseconds. You'll note that our patient had neither of these. She had an elevated tricuspid regurgitant pressure gradient of greater than 60 and a pulmonary artery acceleration time of greater than 60 as well. So this suggests that her pressure increase was not acute. Due to the abnormal findings on our POCUS exam, she ended up getting a CT angiogram of the chest, which showed multiple segmental and subsegmental pulmonary emboli and an enlarged pulmonary artery. A few weeks later, she had a right heart cath and additional studies, which ultimately diagnosed her with chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension. So why do we care about pulmonary hypertension in the emergency department, and why does decompensated pulmonary hypertension cause cardiac arrest? Well, let's go through the pathophys. First, you have a pulmonary artery obstruction, which leads to RV pressures being elevated. Your RV now dilates, and once your RV dilates, three bad things happen. Your RV doesn't function as well, so the stroke volume is decreased. Your tricuspid leaflets don't coapt as well, so you have increased tricuspid regurgitation or blood flow in the wrong direction. And you have your interventricular septum going into your left ventricle, a concept we call ventricular interdependence, which leads to a malfunction of the left ventricle stroke volume, also leading to decreased cardiac output. 
So in this patient, if we kept on giving her fluids, it would worsen her RV dilation and lead to decreased cardiac output and therefore could have led to cardiac arrest. So POCUS was really game changing in this case because it changed the management from a straightforward pneumonia and sepsis to a pneumonia with pulmonary hypertension. And in fact, the patient had 30 cc's per kg of IV fluids ordered from triage. My colleague changed it to a small volume of IV fluids because of her pulmonary hypertension. Patient received anticoagulants for the PEs found on the CT scan. Cardiology and pulmonology were consulted. And like I mentioned, Cardiology performed a right heart cath, which is a gold standard, led to the diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension and CTEF. If POCUS was not performed, I could have easily seen that the patient would have had one of two outcomes. She could have decompensated from her large volume of IV fluids that was given to her for sepsis, or maybe she was treated for pneumonia and discharged home without the critical diagnosis of pulmonary hypertension. And if you're wondering, the troponin and BMP were totally normal. I hope this case was helpful to explain pulmonary hypertension in the emergency department.